From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 189, recorded on November 6th, 2020. Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent, and everybody else. And from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm thinking it's slightly less dramatic because if you're watching this on YouTube, you already know I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I could I could do some switching and fix that. We'll but. do it where like I pop in or something. I could do that in the future if you'd like. Yes. Three and Slowly now. materialize. <laughs> we have a guest today from over across the pond. She is at from the University of Glasgow, Christina Naula. Welcome to TWIP. Hello, everybody. It's good to meet you. Um, oh, good to hear you talk back to me instead of me just listening. It's really <laughs> wonderful to be here. <laughs> good day. Did you, uh, Daniel, did you meet Christina in Glasgow on your last trip? Is that how this came about? Actually, uh, Christina and I have known each other for a few years now. Uh, Christina, actually, I, I believe you've heard of TWIP before, right? You had listened to it maybe <laughs> for a while, and that was I part of our connection. I have listened from the very first, yeah. I've listened from the very first episode. Number one. Wow. Yes, I have, yeah. And um, I got in touch with Daniel maybe three years ago, asking if he would be interested in working with me, um, helping me teach some of our students. Mm. And I was delighted that he did. And not only did he offer to help me, he actually also offered to travel to Glasgow and do the teaching in person. And he's done that two years now. And it's been great fun working with Daniel. Nice. Daniel, You go. how long do you go for typically? Um, I usually go for, it's about five days. I usually show up just uh, to give myself a chance to shift to the time zone. So I'm not um, falling asleep during my lectures. You know, that's always bad form. It's one thing to fall asleep, you know, when Dixon is teaching about parasites, but another yeah, thing yeah. To, to fall asleep when I'm actually up there supposedly teaching. Um, so yeah, I usually go. And then I usually, uh, Christina's usually great about um, structuring it for me to teach uh, two days sort of right next to each other. Mm. Um, and then um, spend usually another day. There's often some other great people um, giving lectures. So um, I try to stay around to listen to a few before I have to head back. Uh, but Christina, maybe before we go forward, do you want to talk a little bit about the Glasgow program and uh, your, your role there? Yeah, I can do that. Yes. Yeah, so um, I am the academic lead of the Glasgow Diploma in Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And um, and I have been doing that since 2015, actually. And I became involved in the role because the course director, Mike Barrett, whom you have also met, Daniel, he wanted to convert this on-campus course into an online blended version of the course so that we could reach more students because at the time we could only reach local Glasgow students really um, because we had like weekly lectures and um, you know we, which would make it dif difficult really for students from other parts of the UK and worldwide to attend so I actually I, I let a transformation or a conversion of this on-campus course into a blended online model, which um, has now been running for five years. And this year, for the first time, it's fully online, um, not because we want to, but because we have to. And yeah, it's it's going well. I think it's going swimmingly so far. I don't know if you know much about Glasgow Diploma courses or the Diploma in Tropical Medicine Hygiene um, structure in the UK at all. Um, I'm happy to talk about that or yeah, I think anything else really our, you'd like to know. Yeah, I think, Christine, I think a lot of our listeners would be curious. I mean, this is um, mm -hmm. anything, something where there's a tremendous need. And, and now, uh, unfortunately, um, due to COVID-19, um, even more of an issue. I mean, we have all these um, uh, tropical medicine programs that have been either shut down or, or crippled by a lack of um, 
you know, NGOs and other organizations being able to continue the the control programs that we mm-hmm. talk a lot about on TWIP. So, um, you know, I've had the pleasure when I go there of meeting a lot of really tremendous, bright, excited students, young and not so young, right? I mean, um, some of them are people mm-hmm. that have done other things and then decided, hey, I want to get involved in tropical medicine. Um, so, yeah, if you want to describe a little bit about the program, I think our listeners would love to hear about how they can potentially... Okay. Uh, yeah, um, I think the first, first thing I just want to say, it may seem a bit odd that um, in Glasgow or in the UK, you know, we teach tropical medicine because it is not um, it is not particularly tropical. In fact, it is um, about six degrees outside today and foggy, so um, it couldn't be further from the tropics. And really, that is obviously because of the colonial history of the country. And um, so really UK doctors were often encountering patients from the colonies like servicemen or merchants and, you know, had really unusual infectious disease and mostly mostly parasitic. And so there was an interest in training those UK based doctors in learning more about these infectious diseases and um, building up a program to teach that more formally. So actually the first DTMH was um, established in, when was that? In maybe 1903, that was when the first DTMH examination took place. So a long, long time ago. And since then, um, you probably know of the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. They both run DTMH courses. And there's a few other courses now in the UK. Now, what, what we the courses have in common, we all work from the same syllabus and our students are all examined by the Royal College of Physicians in London, who are the awarding institution, the awarding body. So all the DTMH courses um, in the UK, they feed into that same examination. So we have a kind of a unified um, qualification structure for that. So, and actually Dixon probably knows that Scotland was a, a has really an interesting and long, long-standing history of tropical medicine, many outstanding tropical medicine doctors and explorers came from Scotland, David Livingston being one of them. Yeah. And um, obviously we have got Manson and William Leishman. And it just, I mean, there's quite a few, um, a few really interesting explorers that I could mention. And I think sure. that highlights another interesting aspect really that we have specifically in Scotland. So um, in Scotland, Education was really open to everybody. So, you know, people from poorer backgrounds, they could still go and go to university and become doctors and lawyers and whatnot. Um, But then very often, while they were able to get an education, they could actually not practice in Scotland because they would either not have the connections or they wouldn't have the money to open a practice. So, and that's the reason why many of these Scottish explorer doctors, well, many of these Scottish doctors actually ended up being explorers or missionary doctors um, making their way to the colonies in Britain. And I think that is quite fascinating. And that's maybe why, um, you know, Another reason why tropical medicine teaching is actually quite big um, in our country. So I've kind of lost track now where I was. That's Someone will need to no, no, bring no, me back no. on track. <laughs> no, no, I think, no. no it, it is, Join it, the group. <laughs> yeah, no, it is amazing. You go to uh, Glasgow, and I always pronounce it um, wrong. I, I always enjoy, Christina, how your children say, why does he talk so funny when you know, I come to visit? <laughs> but, uh, we wonder that too, by the way. So, <laughs> um, but no, you, here you go. Here you I, go I think it's my children who talk funny. <laughs> no, no. Um, but no, here you go to um, <laughs> Glasgow, Scotland, and it is, it's kind of a Mecca for where all these, you know, the, the great uh, parasitologists have, have come from. And, and I love, I, uh, I often spend mm. time speaking with uh, Richard, uh, Christina's husband, about how um, the Scottish uh, trained scientists, trained uh, doctors would end up off, you know, in the colonies, in the military, um, seeing all these fascinating mm. things and yeah. then bringing that knowledge back. That's right. Um, 
So yeah, it's actually, it's interesting. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. talk about studying, tro- you know, tropical medicine in the tropics. Is that something quite exciting about studying tropical medicine, um, you know, where a lot of these great parasitologists actually have their roots? Here, here. Mm. So, Chris, and actually, parasitology is still really big in in Scotland. Mm. But you have a lot of people in uh, Scotland for parasites of cattle, and poultry, and things of this sort, because you have an economics. Uh, I, I have. To, I have to admit to you, Dixon, I'm not very well versed in um, animal parasitology and veterinary parasitology. So, um, and I know a few um, chicken parasitologists, but. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. Yeah. So there's this, I'm more familiar with the human side of parasitology. Right. In the old days, when they went to the meetings like the British Society for Parasitology, et cetera, you'd always meet the uh, group from Glasgow uh, from the vet school. And uh, mm. that's, I, I got into the worm group and I never left that group. <laughs> <laughs> Dick Dixon, uh, a chicken parasitologist, is someone who's yeah. afraid. That's exactly right. He's just a- <laughs> uh, Christina, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your background? Where you're f- where are you from originally? Oh yeah, um, so I was born in Switzerland um, in the last century, and um, <laughs> I, I did all my schooling and all my higher education. I did it locally, really, which seemed to be the normal way at the time in Switzerland. So I studied biology at the University of Bern. And I was originally actually going to become a virologist, Vincent. Um, But somehow I got sidetracked by parasites. Um, It was actually particularly Totally understandable. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So it, it was actually the worms that turned me over to parasitology. So we had some really amazing... Um, Helminth lectures by a chap called Bruno Gottstein. I don't know if if, if you know him, Vincent, uh, not Vincent Dixon. Um, so, you know, I thought it was really fascinating. And then I just ended up um, becoming a parasitologist, although I've focused all my, you know, so my, I did a master's by research and a PhD, and I did both of those in the with um, working with African trypanosomes. And um, so my main interest there was really signaling transduction pathways in trypanosomes, which I suppose is a little bit niche. Um, <laughs> and then <laughs> um, always, you know, the end point obviously would always be, you know, wanted to learn more. It was basic search to learn more about parasites to, to make those infections more treatable. Um, because as you know, there's, there's, well, there is now, but there wasn't really any, there, there aren't really any good drugs that are safe to use mm. to treat African trypanosomiasis and actually many of those parasitic diseases. So I, I basically spent many years of my life um, doing various projects, basic research in trypanosomes. And then I moved to Glasgow and that was a bit um, coincidental really because I was initially going to work in Strasbourg and I was going to shift gears and going to become an insect immunologist. Um, But that just never happened. (laughs) I came to Glasgow for a year um, in 1999 and I haven't left since. Hmm. So, yeah. All right. And I spent a few years doing postdocing, and eventually um, I felt, I just felt staying in research wasn't for me. And I, you know, I tried to get more and more teaching experience under my belt, and I, I completely moved out of research in 2008. And I have been a full time educator ever since. And I've been moving around a little bit from different departments. Um, but as I said, I have been with the Diploma in Tropical mm-hmm. Medicine for the past five years. And I think I think this is where I'm hoping to settle for the rest of my professional career. Hmm. Um, so you have a lot of good virology there in, in Glasgow. I visited uh, a couple of times the MRC Center for Virus Research. Um, so you, you could always uh, visit revisit your virology 
instincts, you know. I could, yeah. <laughs> and in fact, I came to your um, Stoker Award lecture, Vincent, ah. when you gave that here in Glasgow. And I came to shake your hand because I was so in awe of all things Twiff. <laughs> cool. Very good. I have the uh, Stoker. I got, so, a, I got a plaque for the Stoker Award and it's right on the wall. In front mm. of me, Sir Michael Stoker, okay. CVR Award 2012. Yeah. And it's a wonderful picture of uh, yeah. viruses made by the structural virologist over there. What is his, I can't remember his name now. Oh my gosh, but it's gorgeous. I had a great time. <laughs> that was fun. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had fun too. I enjoyed that lecture. Great. <clears throat> 2012. Wow. Years ago. Christina, would you know if uh, Robert Bruce is from uh, Scotland? Um, I don't know at the top of my head, but I could have a wee look in that amazing book that we have. It's called The Scottish Encounter with Tropical Disease. Ah. Uh, it's a tiny little booklet and I could find Bruce is in there in 1905. So there he must go. have been from Scotland. Ah, yes. Um, so the I, I don't know the details. The trypanosome you were working on was named after him. Yes, it was. Yeah, in fact. And Bruce Alexis, he, Alexis, so Alexis. David Bruce, yes. Yeah, so he was um, he was actually born to Scottish parents in Melbourne, Australia. Ah, well, and then we re returned to Scotland to Stirling when he was five. And he was educated at the University of Edinburgh. There you go. So he, he was a proper Scotsman, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I had to cheat. I didn't know that at the top of my head. I wish I had known it, but yeah. I didn't. <laughs> so, so the structural <laughs> yes, virologist, uh, the structural virologist was David Bella. Ah. Oh yes, yeah, I've met He's him. Well I, I didn't say I know him, but I have met him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, it's time to do some twip business, Daniel. Let's do right. uh, our clinical case. Remind us what we have here. Yeah, so let me remind everyone, um, or for those of you tuning in for the first time, um, let us tell, tell the story. <laughs> um, this was a, uh, a, a large man, a tall man, a 200-pound man who uh, had an issue with a rash. So the large man with the rash. He had a full-body rash that had been plaguing him for months. Um, he had gone and, and seen multiple uh, clinicians, uh, he had seen the allergist who gave him cream and prednisone. Um, this had helped a little bit, um, but then things had gotten worse. Um, at one point, he was actually given three pills of ivermectin. Um, and again, things got a little bit better for a few weeks, and then the rash worsened. Um, he then saw his primary care doctor. Sort of interesting, right? He started with the specialist, and then he ended up seeing his primary care doc. Uh, the <laughs> primary care doc did a very thorough exam um, and found some abnormal areas between the toes, uh, did some scrapings, uh, sent these to the lab. Um, and when these came back, he asked a few more questions. Turned out that the wife was also suffering from similar um, complaints. Um, at this point, he gave this large man a larger dose of ivermectin, <laughs> just the three pills. Uh, he repeated that two weeks later. The wife was also treated. Um, and then he and the wife uh, did recover. Um, he uh, was COVID negative. This gives you a little bit of a timing <laughs> Um, no, uh, no HIV. So he was HIV negative. Um, not a man who drinks or smokes. Um, and uh, he had uh, reported um, that his wife had actually gone on a trip a little bit before any of this had occurred, um, had not been very far away, but had actually stayed in a hotel, which seems to have preceded this, no suggesting any causality, but just putting that out there. Um, I got involved with the case because this man had um, actually developed um, an infected area in one of the areas where he had scratched a little bit too exuberantly. Um, just to give you a sort of update, that at this point is doing better. Um, unfortunately, this man had some issues with peripheral vascular disease, so it took quite a bit of time for this wound to heal, required some interventions. Um, but just at this point in time, the man is home, he's out of the hospital, he's doing well. Uh, but that is our case. All right. Dixon, can you take that first one? You're muted, Dixon. <laughs> 
<laughs> you got to start from the beginning. You got to. I said I, I will give it that. I will give it my best attempt, and I start with a muted mic. That's fine. <laughs> That's not my best attempt. Sorry. <laughs> This is Kevin writes, dear Twitch doctors, very clever, uh, case guest for TWIP 188, Sarcoptes scabii, as suggested by the interdigital distribution and nocturnal itch, timing of the itch, the duration, transmission between partners, possible acquisition in a hotel bed, the diagnosis by skin scraping, and the course of ivermectin treatment. The patient had itching all over, which is often due to spread of allergens rather than the mites themselves. I wondered whether the immune slash allergy response to the mites might be different in older individuals. All I found so far was a study of scabies outbreaks in nursing homes that reported fewer hosts reporting symptoms or showing burrows in the typical spots. Perhaps our patients were diagnosed later because physicians were not looking in the right places for the burrows. Unrelatedly, the thought recently struck me that the feats of Toxoplasma gondii are often talked about such as its incredible ability to infect so many hosts and cell types without being eliminated by the immune system. However, this is the only one, this is only one side of a coevolutionary story. Shifting perspective, there could be selective pressure for harmless parasites if the immune response would be costly, ineffective, and dangerous. To anthropomorphize, the success of T. Gandhi could be attributed to our apathy as much as its guile. Perhaps this isn't such a novel thought, but I was invigorated by it. Best regards, Kevin. Hmm. Dixon, yeah. do, you, do you think that's a good idea? Um, it's difficult to know. I know that in some cases, organisms start out highly virulent and over time develop a relationship with their host, which eventually ends up coexisting and everybody's happy and over, you know, thousands of years perhaps. But And I know this is a theory that... Uh, is uh, being uh, purported by some uh, um, infectious disease epidemiologists and evolutionists. Um, every idea is good until you can do an experiment to see what's going on. What is the apathy? I mean, it's just because... Well, it's anthropomorphizing. He's anthropomorphizing. He's, he's saying that the immune system is apathetic. I don't think so. This parasite actually has a, a lot of survival mechanisms, and it silences the immune response mm. in order okay. to survive. Okay. So I don't think it's an apathetic immune system. Okay. And I don't think it's as much of a guile either. It's selective pressure by evolution that resulted in this relationship. So uh, the anthropomorphizing doesn't really work out too well that way. I was thinking a little bit, like, as he said this about, you know, how vigorous, you know, growing up, I was always told like a few things. Um, one of them was <laughs> don't, don't, eat, <laughs> don't eat, don't eat raw bacon. Um, All right. 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 You know, and, right. That's always been pushed because apparently there was something called, I think it was what, trichinella? Is that like, yeah, 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 I think so. Yeah, um, yeah, you yeah. know, and, and we're very worried about that. But, you know, when was the last time you said, oh, don't eat raw lamb, don't eat other meats, you know, rare or undercooked? Um, well, I think we're not quite as worried about getting um, Toxoplasma gondii. So maybe that's a certain amount of the apathy, mm, right? You, I see. you go to France, you go oh, to France. Oh, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Yeah, there isn't this, oh my gosh, you'll you'll end up, it's like, whatever. That's but I think his implication was the immune system is apathetic. Yeah. Which I, <laughs> you know, I don't think you can apply that characteristic to a, a non-thinking entity. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Daniel, can you take the next one? Uh, certainly. Tim writes, greetings, twip. The twipping is so much nicer when the case study is easily treatable. <laughs> it involves an old guy with senescent immunology versus the baby with hydrocephaly. Uh, um, he's referring to our twip 187. Um, my searches using ivermectin as keyword and further readings are pointing to scabies. Returning to your textbook confirms this, I think. <laughs> Chapter 39, arachnids, human itch mite, Sarcoptes scabii, page 489. Paras parasitic Diseases by Dixon de Pommier et al. I guess I'm one of the et al's in there. Um, <laughs> Parasites Without Borders. Two nice footnotes in your textbook on ivermectin to treat this. Um, and then he lists a few here. Um, and then actually the New England Journal one there. He has a nice, nice two-minute video on the SHIFT trial exploring permethrin versus ivermectin for this last footnote. Um, and he says it's worth the, the NEJM account creation to view this. 
Um, and he has a link in there, which I'm actually encouraged to go to the show notes um, and click on this if you can. I, I wish it was um, public access, free access. There wasn't a barrier here, but it's a nice little video, little video vignette, which actually links to what actually was a pretty land. I, I think it was a landmark study, the shift study. Um, I really like this tidbit and the many places throughout the textbook as well, just north of the arachnids chapter. I wasn't aware of Miriam, and now I am. Many people think and have thought about parasites. Now I am one of um, them, thanks to TWIP and others like you and Miriam who think and thought harder still carry on. Um, and actually, this was a great study. This was um, sort of close to my heart. It was an island study. They went to a bunch of islands in the Pacific, not in Panama, but we could do this in Panama. And they, um, they treated some people with permethrin, some people with regularly scheduled ivermectin, some people they didn't, just sort of hygiene um, encouragement, um, and actually were able to show a reduction in the incidence of scabies. So um, should this be scabies, we'll talk more about that. Christina, can you take the next one? I can. Barbara writes, the man has scabies. I'm an ordinary lay person, so I don't know much. But the increased itchiness at night, the likely spread from his wife via the hotel bedding or towels, and the eventual diagnosis from skin scapings indicates this is scabies. I don't know why ivermectin was given rather than scabicide ointments. What a wonderful term. <laughs> perhaps of old age or perhaps the previous treatments had failed. I do hope they decontaminated their bedding and clothes. Scabies is quite common here in South Africa amongst young children in early childhood centres. At least it was until COVID-19 put most ECD centres out of business. Who knows what children are suffering now? Scabies, lack of stimulation, toxic stress, deep in poverty, hunger. Thanks for your cheerful, chatty, informative podcast, a kind that make you interested. Mm -hmm. Barbara, 30 C, 13 centigrades, windy, drought conditions. Mm. David writes, hello, TWIP. For the case presented during this episode, I will submit a guess of Norwegian or crusted scabies caused by mite infestation. Patients both fit the profile of individuals that could be at risk due to their age and presumably their lower immune system responses. With the wife experiencing the symptoms first, possibly from exposure during her trip and stay at a hotel, her return home in an infested state could have easily passed this along to the husband. Dr. Griffin's characterization of the brown scabbed area between the toes seems to fit with a case of crusted scabies. If the sample collected showed mites, eggs, or other signs of infection, the prescription of ivermectin would be indicated. The description of the stronger dosage and repeated use of ivermectin also seems to fit with the guess. Very curious as to what this is, if not scabies. I made the assumption that this was a locally sourced infection versus a more exotic tropical disease. Thanks for the show and providing productive brain stimulation while we hunker down, waiting for the COVID fall and winter to pass. Take care, <laughs> David from Abingdon, Maryland. Dixon. Jeremy writes, wife picked up the Sarcoptes in the hotel, took them home with him, had scabies. <laughs> this guy um, obviously works on a shortwave radio doing <laughs> that. <laughs> that was sent by telegram. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Why don't you take the next one, Dixon? I would be happy to. Alexander writes, dear Twippers, I'm a regular listener of TWIV since the corona pandemic, not missing a single episode. Lately, I've also discovered TWIP and the possibility to participate in solving the case. In the actual case, a lot leads to a diagnosis of scabies. It is caused by mites and is typically acquired after skin-to-skin -skin contact. Occasionally, transmission may occur via fomites, bedding or clothing, like in a hotel. It leads to a generalized rash, which is an immune reaction to the mites. The rash is more severe at night in bed because of increased temperature. I think the rash can be influenced by cortisone, although this does not solve the problem as the mites are still there. Scabies can be treated by giving ivermectin, but you always have to treat the partner too. Otherwise, you get ping pong infections. After making the diagnosis, finding a lesion between the toes where the skin is thin and an ideal location for the mites to infest and treating both of the couple led to the resolution of the disease and clearance of the rash. Looking forward to more interesting parasite, parasitic cases. Best regards from Germany, Alexander. Daniel. Susan writes, love your show. 
my guest for 90 year old man and wife, bed bugs. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> so this is a second, second telegram um, reply. Yeah, I, this, this distracted made me think of, I have only received a telegram once in my life. Hmm. And it was about six days before I was boarding a plane to head to um, Sierra Leone. Um, I was supposed to spend three months working at um, the Masanga Leprosy Hospital. And it was a, a short telegram, um, you know, do not come, fleeing Freetown, um, rebels revolt. This is back um, <laughs> in the early 90s. And it was really, it was pretty horrific um, uh, thing that occurred. I don't know if people remember what happened, but this was in the early 90s, the rebels actually came out of the sort of surrounding areas. They took um, Freetown. And the way they were actually sort of getting um, international press is they were chopping limbs off of their victims with mm. machetes. And so the, uh, the ambulance with one of the doctors and nurses with whom I was going to be working, um, were actually outside the compound when this happened and the ambulance wow. was firebombed. So it's quite, uh, quite something. So just, uh, you know, when you, when you go to do your international global work, sometimes it's, um, not exactly the safest uh, adventure that you might have thought. So, um, but back to, uh, back to better things. Take the next one, Daniel. <laughs> Leland writes, dear twiplets, when I was in medical school, an old sage once told us that if interaction with a patient left you feeling depressed, then there was a high probability that the patient was suffering from depression. <laughs> I found this to be a useful trigger for further investigations but I've also been aware that this effect is not limited to psychiatric disorders. This case in point, as Daniel began giving the details of the case, I subconsciously began to rub my forearms and the back of my ears. And the more information was given, the itchier I got until by the end of the presentation, I myself was ready to claw my own skin off. As anyone who has ever taken care of a patient knows, the mere mention of scabies is more potent irritant than poison ivy. And I suspect that I am not the only one still itching to render a diagnosis. So just like my mentor's observations on depression, my own pruritus clenched this diagnosis for me. Yes, this patient has scabies. Uh, his history is classic, gradual progression, nocturnal exacerbations, transient response to steroids only to worsen, and a transient response to ivermectin. I would also add that unfortunately, the missed opportunities to diagnose, treat, and cure this common problem is also classic in the presentation. Often I see these patients only after others have offered antihistamines, steroids, both topical and systemic, and a bewildering variety of pills, potions, and poultices, none of which have treated the problem effectively. In this case, this man acquired the infection from his wife and he was ultimately prescribed the proper drug, ivermectin, but he never got a second dose of the drug two weeks later to dispatch the eggs, which hatched following the eradication of the infestation with the first dose. Ivermectin does not kill eggs that have been already laid. So the second dose is almost always necessary. You might say that one dose barely scratches the surface. <laughs> Scabies is passed almost exclusively by direct skin-to-skin -skin contact, but fomite transmission can and occasionally does occur. The mites burrow into the skin, causing an intense inflammatory reaction, and the females lay eggs, which then hatch and continue to burrow. Initial infections are usually limited in scope and can often be identified by linear rashes on and between the fingers or other intertriginous areas. But over time, or with a large initial exposure, the rash can become more generalized. Patients with compromised immune systems can progress to the most severe form crusted or Norwegian scabies. In this case, the rash is overwhelming and can be heaped up and warty appearing. I do not think the patient in question had the Norwegian variety because he does not really fall into any one of the risk groups. And because crusted scabies is often paradoxically not pruritic as his was reported as being. Treatment for this patient should be two doses of ivermectin separated by two weeks. If he indeed does have Norwegian scabies, then he should probably receive doses of ivermectin on days one, three, five, seven, and 14, and also simultaneously be treated with topical permethrin. His wife also needs to be treated at the same time as do any other close contacts. In summary, I'm itching now, therefore it must be scabies. Now back to the diabetic feet. 
the endocarditis, the UTI that really isn't a UTI, and the COVID. Oh, and the occasional ectoparasite. Ah, the life of the ID physician, Leland <laughs> Allen, MD. Nice. Christina. Jana writes, first time guests are here. I would love to win the book. You don't even have to sign it for me. Just send right away with no delay. <laughs> I think the man and his wife have scabies. I caught it when I went to my college orientation week in 1976. It started as a small scaly patch on one shoulder. And because I didn't get it seen, it grew to cover my whole body. It took months of lotion to get rid of it. Along with washing all my clothes and bed clothes in in hot water for that whole time. I'm still not 100% sure if it's completely gone since for years when I would get sick or run down, I would occasionally see the characteristic wavy tracks on my skin. I checked the Mayo Clinic site and found that ivermectin is a current treatment for it. Thanks for all you do. I am crazy about Twif, Trivo, Twip, Twim and all the Twixes. Also immune, Tatiana. Hmm. Dixon. No, it's me. Sorry. It is you. That's I'll right. leave you out, Vincent. Yeah. <laughs> Sandra writes, greetings, esteemed doctors. I'm a medical lab technician in training from Germany. Parasitology was never a priority topic in the apprenticeship and thus was one of the first victims of the retrenchments as a result of the pandemic. This makes me even more thankful to you for helping me to keep my knowledge fresh and my enthusiasm for the field high. As for the case, the temporary and later lasting relief, thanks to ivermectin, rules out a fungal infection and strongly suggests some sort of parasite is the cause. First dose of ivermectin only providing limited alleviation speaks for a more persistent nematode infection rather than scabies, which would on be the only ectoparasitic infestation I'm aware of that would result in a similar clinical manifestation as scabies should be eradicated with a single application of ivermectin. The abnormal patch, the primary care doctor be discovered betwixt the patient's toes, is likely to be the area where the agent has first entered the host. A number of nematodes are known to cause ground rash, but I found only one of them to penetrate skin in order to enter the host and respond to ivermectin in the fashion presented here. This last worm standing is strongyloides, whose larvae are able to cause a full body rash, enters the host by penetrating their skin and ultimately defeated by ivermectin while not admitting defeat after one relatively low dose. While more common in tropical regions, it's not excluded to get infected in more temperate climatic zones. Thus, my final diagnosis is larva currents due to infection with strongyloides stercoralis. Thanks for this case, which I personally found challenging, and I hope to have made the right conclusions. Take care, stay healthy, best regards. Wow, a different answer. How about that? Indeed. Dixon. James writes, wonder why my son-in-law, Arthur Pod Bate, has not gotten this one yet. I should shut my mouth. Basically, I guess this means that every time he goes outside, he gets bitten by uh, mosquitoes. Sarcoptes scabii, a small mite, arachnid, not an insect, that burrows in the skin, causing intense pruritus in between digits is a classic clue. A bit unusual to go systemic, like you describe, although there is this Norwegian scabies syndrome with more general symptoms, probably drove the Vikings to pillage the UK. <laughs> hmm. Differential. Hmm. Creeping eruptions sounds dramatic, caused by hookworms, cutaneous larva migrans, lice of various kinds, I guess, probably body lice. Circarial dermatitis, unlikely since unless they did a surreptitious trip to Africa or global warming has progressed more rapidly in the Northeast and someone inoculated some snails into the local fly fishing waters. I, this is really <laughs> a, a stretch. This is a stretch. Um, we'll come back to that. Ringworm sounds like a parasite, but it is an unfortunate name for a fungus. It can itch pretty bad, too. Agilian dermatitis syndromes, of course, although I doubt they are highly sensitive to ivermectin, keep up the good work. Hmm. Um, what was his guess? I think it was. Oh, the guess, uh, the small mites. I think scabies. it was uh, scabies. Small yeah. Mites. yeah, but. Scabies uh, within a little bit of. Uh, <laughs> a, a humorous tour <laughs> of. <laughs> well, he did a differential, right, Daniel? That's good. Yeah, 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 that's you know, right. You still got to, you know, it's one of those tough things. Even if you know what it is, you're still supposed to have a differential. Uh, this is all true. All right. So Luke writes, um, hi, Dixon, 
Daniel and Vincent. He didn't know you were coming, Christina, so I'll add and Christina. <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> Twip 188. Case sounds to me like scabies. <clears throat> A few other possible causes, but less likely in temperate climates. And the history of the patient's wife sleeping in a hotel bed makes me think it is the cause. Maybe the brown lesion between the man's toes was the cardinal sign of the scabies mite and the microscopic triangular trail it leaves on the skin. I'm starting my medical internship in Alice Springs in Central Australia in January, where scabies is a big problem, not only because of the primary infection, but because of the co-infection with strep pyogenes causing post-strep syndromes like rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease, and glomerular nephritis. Anyway, I hope my guess was right after going on about scabies. <laughs> Thanks for the always enjoyable show, Luke Canberra. Christina. Alexander writes, and I have to say, I keep scratching myself. <laughs> Dear professors, <laughs> the elderly couple with the rash that got better on ivermectin probably suffer from an infection with Sarcoptes scabii, i.e. scabies. These mites burrow through the skin and lay their eggs in the outer layers of the epidermis. The symptoms that people experience, mainly an itchy rash, are caused by the local IgE-mediated reaction to the mites. Their eggs and their... Cybala, the balls of mite poop. Treatment is usually topical permethrin, cream or bath, in, in conjunction with strict hygiene, including daily changing and washing of all clothes and bed sheets, airing out mattresses and textiles, and extending these to all household members. Oral ivermectin is usually reserved for second line treatment in combination with permethrin or for people who are unable to follow hygiene guidance. The source of infection here might have been the hotel the wife stayed in a few months back, as these mites can survive for hours to days in bed sheets and clothes. The lesion between the toes of the gentleman might be a form of crusted scabies. While most people suffering from a scabies infection only have a handful of adult mites on or or rather in their body, immune compromised people can develop thick crusts of scabies. There is no evidence of immune suppression here, but I've seen a small number of crusted scabies cases in people in long-term care facilities who were unable to scratch themselves due to advanced neurological disease. The inaccessibility of the site might provide fertile breeding ground for the mites here. I hope both of your patients manage to eradicate those nasty little buggers. I know that this can be very challenging. Keep safe, keep healthy, and all the best to the TWIP team and all other listeners. Alexander, Vienna, Austria, 17 centigrade, 63 Fahrenheit, and a breathtaking golden autumn sunset. Gosh, we have such an international listenership. I guess that's because of parasites. <laughs> I, I think it's Dixon. He is muted, but I think, you know, he has an international appeal. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to deny that. <laughs> it's a good thing I don't wear hats. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> all right. Katie Jane writes, dear all, I vowed to write sooner, yet somehow it has been almost a year. Mm. I have no real excuse. Except, well, 2020 happened, I had a baby, and I will admit that raising a neonate in the midst of a pandemic has not been without challenges, emotional and otherwise. I'm finally getting caught up on missed episodes and listening to Vincent state with such optimism at the beginning of January's episode that 2020 is going to be a great year brought with the wisdom of hindsight and ironic smile to my face. It's interesting to listen to the coronavirus situation evolve through the podcast, and when I am caught up on TWIP, I will move to TWIV to try to learn more. I did say that at the beginning of the year. I said, it's going to be a great year. Yes. Sorry, <laughs> folks. <laughs> I decided to skip ahead to the current episode in the meantime so that I would be able to enter a guess at Daniel's case study. I'm a little disappointed that I missed the previous episode's case study as I guess Toxo immediately. Alas, such is life. I'm God. The prognosis for the infant was optimistic. For this week's case, 90-year-old man and wife, severe itching, particularly at night, unlikely to be allergies. My first thought was bed bugs, Cymex lenticularis, lectularius, sorry, especially because the wife had stayed in a hotel not too far prior to the symptoms occurring. However, from further reading, it seems as though people eventually become desensitized to the bites, which is clearly not the case here. 
Also, it's unlikely that treatment with ivermectin would clear the infection as bed bugs would continue to be present in the environment. This leads me to the same case uh, cause as my previous TWIP guess, another ectoparasite, Sarcoptes scabii or scabies. Scabies causes nocturnal itching, generalized body rashes diagnosed by a skin scraping, often from skin between the digits. PD7 states that treatment of all members of the family may be needed to prevent reinfection, which would support the evidence of both husband and wife receiving treatment, issue being resolved. System systemic treatment with ivermectin is proven particularly efficacious. So my guess is scabies. I may be wrong, but I told myself I would submit my guess these e this evening. And these days, if I don't stick to a deadline, things never get done. Thank you again for all you do to edutain. Katie Jane is in Walsaw, Wisconsin. We are having a beautiful fall and the baby is sleeping. <laughs> a sleeping baby is one of the most wonderful things. As indeed. I think indeed. all parents can agree. <laughs> <laughs> Vicky writes... Dearest Twippers, it's 7.10 a.m. and the skies are clear in Duluth, 47 degrees F by the lake and 41 on the hill. I'm guessing our elder couple, elderly couple had scabies. The hotel visit and that one gave the rash. The others is the hint. I consulted with my friend Deb, retired hospital microbiologist, and she said that the mites are very hard to get from a scraping. In all her years working, she never saw a single critter. Our gentleman had a positive scraping from between his toes. The mites are common in the webbings between the fingers, so why not the toes? Confirming my diagnosis, ivermectin cured the condition, although two successive doses were necessary. An avid fan, Vicky. P.S. Regarding the topic of the death of expertise using Amazon, I've sent a copy of the book, Higher Superstition, The Academic Left and Its War on Science, due to arrive at Vincent's office by October 19th. By the academic theft, a oh, left, <laughs> sorry, left, we don't mean people who vote as Democrats, rather the term refers to those who post with postmodernist views, typically in departments with studies in the title, sometimes called collectively grievance studies, I hope in good humor. My husband, Bruce Hendrickson, retired literature professor, was one of those postmodernists, but after reading Higher Superstition, he saw the light and gave up his postmodernist ways. <laughs> oh, so Vicki, here's the book, I, uh, it arrived. Yeah. Thank you so much. I look forward to reading it. Higher Superstition. <sighs> Daniel. Oh, Wayne writes, Dear Twip, I enjoyed the last episode as ever, but also noticed that you didn't get a chance to discuss a paper in the episode despite it being an hour and a half long. <laughs> Is this because you get so many guesses or that the letters are too long? I, I'm sure we as your audience wouldn't mind making them briefer if that gives you more time to delve into other aspects of parasitology. Uh -huh. Maybe it was just something about last week, though. In which case, please excuse my pearl clutching panic that we we're at risk of losing one of my favorite parts of TWIP. I think the patient in Daniel's last case has crusted or Norwegian scabies given the scraping from between the toes yielding the diagnosis. The interdigital web is a classic place for scabies mites to live. Ivermectin treatment was successful, which further corroborates this. This is usually seen in immunocompromised patients are his age and diabetes enough to account for it in this case? Sorry to hear that you can't become a millionaire from selling old copies of West Nile Story, Dixon. Uh, thanks again to you guys for providing my favorite edutainment of all in these strange times. Sincerely, Owen. Oh, Owen, I think... Owen, we, just Owen. Owen, uh, we will certainly do papers, but in fact, we're not going to do one today. Um Part of the problem, it is we record on Friday evening and it gets late and we don't want to keep everyone. But th do not shorten your letters. They're great the way they are. It's just right. that there are a lot I of love, them. Yeah, I love the letters. I love like hearing how people are thinking it through. I think that's um, that's fantastic. Yeah. 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 We've got two Shisto papers coming up soon. So I think you'll be rewarded with your uh, desires. Christina. Dear Shiler, Shiler writes, Christina, you are muted. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, actually, those letters, those long letters are really good and useful for our students because with every letter, yeah. you know, they learn something new. And if maybe, 
you, you know, you, ha- you have a very clear idea of what a case might be or what the diagnosis is, but there may be other nuances to it that you have missed. And I think, you know, for the students in particular, they're a really good learning opportunity. Good. Um, I like listening to them. <laughs> Scala writes, dear trip team, my goodness, I can't believe I forgot to write in for your last episode, even after having discussed the case with my med school's ID interest group. How am, how am I ever to win the book if I keep forgetting to write in? I was happy to introduce the group to your podcast. So far, due to the fully virtual curriculum, we haven't been able to do much. I have, however, been enjoying the virtual once monthly talks on tropical medicine. On to the case then. The full body rash and the multiple different medication attempts remind me of a dermatology joke. If it's dry, wet it. If it's wet, dry it. If it's on steroids, stop the steroids. If it's off steroids, start steroids. If you know what it is, don't touch it. And if you don't know what it is, for God's sake, for God's sake don't touch it. <laughs> Itchiness is extraordinarily unpleasant. It's terrible that the man and his wife had to suffer for so many months before being able to find relief. Extreme itchiness, symptom persistence despite multiple treatments, and the presence of lesions in between the toes all point to scabies as my main guess. Interesting that ivermectin is used to treat scabies, even though I think of it as an anti-helminthic drug and scabies are mites. However, it appears to be a treatment for various arthropods, including mites, lice, and bed bugs. I also wonder whether there may were any lesions in between a man's fingers, where people tend to look for scabies. Good thought on the PCP's part to do a literal head-to-toe exam and check the toe, toe webbing. It is refreshing. It is a refreshing 57 Fahrenheit here in our national, nation's capital. Wishing you all continued safety and good health. Skyler, she pronounce pronounce Skyler, she her. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Andrew writes Kia Ora from Pongaroa. Weather: high winds producing a spectacular cloudscape and eighteen degrees C. No book one yet. I asked a fortune teller to see if I would win, and they said I was bound to win if my number came up in the draw. <laughs> Feeling confident. <laughs> COVID-19, our Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, who led us to virtual elimination of the virus in New Zealand, has won a resounding vote of confidence and returned to power in a landslide in our recent elections. Perhaps other politicians should take note. Following the scientific advice pays off. However, it is probably advisable to schedule one's pandemics to avoid coinciding with national elections. We are also seeing many doctors moving to the country, mostly from the USA, Sorry about that. <laughs> My guess, the human itch might Sarcoptes scabii. Like the teacher in TWIP 176, a head-to-toe examination gives the answer. The difference is that the arthropods were nestling between the toes rather than the fingers. PD7 states currently scabies has reached pandemic proportions. I wonder if the measures to deal with COVID-19 will lead to a reduction in the prevalence of this and other infections that rely on close human contact to spread. Also, one has to wonder how something like this would be picked up in a video consultation. Mmm. Nigamihi Andrew. Dixon. Peter writes, Dear three Twipeters, or Twipeters, or Torpeters, uh, the case study in Twip 188 is of a man with full body rash with a wife with similar infection that resolves after a course of ivermectin. The man in question is in his 90s with diabetes and hypertension and thus can be said to have a suppressed, suppressed immune system. The description of a parasite affecting both people that live together, one of whom seems to have caught it while staying at a hotel, sounds like it could be scabies caused by the human itch mite Sarcoptes scabii. The description of the rash is the full body it ha- as full body is a little bit unusual. The scabies associated rash is generally found on the belly, buttocks, upper back, and elbows. PD 7th edition, uh, page 489. Perhaps the rash is more widespread because of the patient's weaker immune system. The abnormal area between the toes could be a skin, could be a skin. 
skin as shown in the first photo on this page. This is associated with the actual burrows of the mite. Transmission is via skin-to-skin -skin contact and can include transmission via bedding, although this is apparently somewhat rare. Ivermectin is an effective treatment, PD-7, page 491, but the medicine is not without side effects. Treatment of the affected areas with pyrethrin is another option, but it can lead to a temporary worsening of scabies symptoms. Peter, writing from a partly cloudy Cape Town where the temperature is predicted to be to peak at 19 CF today. <laughs> One moment, please. I have got a... Request. Well, no, 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 go ahead. Please go ahead. Continue. Daniel. Okay. Catherine writes, hello again to the TWIP team. Here's my response to the case presented by Dr. Daniel Griffin in TWIP 188. Well, this one was fun. Based on the clues provided, my guess is the elderly couple unfortunately acquired scabies caused by an infection of the parasite Sarcoptes scabii, a microscopic mite known as the itch mite. Furthermore, the husband contracted a secondary bacterial infection with Streptococcus pyogenes, which can follow scabies and resulted in the presentation of cellulitis of his foot. This guess is based on throwing the following clues into the hopper and hoping one parasite would connect them all. Age and generally healthy status, the initial infection of the wife, the wife's trip and hotel stay, the long period of infection of both spouses, the scraping of a brown scabbed area between the toes of the husband's foot that led to the diagnosis of his development of a full body rash, the second effective treatment with high doses of ivermectin and cellulitis on the husband's foot. If this guess is correct, the disease must have been a complete mystery to the couple as symptoms of scabies can take up to a month or two to develop in persons without a previous infection. Without knowing more detail about timing and location, it's also difficult to know how the wife acquired the parasite, but her trip and hotel stay offer a possible scenario. If her hotel room had been previously occupied by a guest with scabies, the mites could survive up to two to three days without careful cleaning. The CDC suggests decontamination requires careful vacuuming of furniture and carpets and using the hot cycles to wash and dry bedding and towels. As an aside, just how comfortable are parasitologists in hotel rooms? <laughs> I mean, as I read this, I cringe and wonder why I ever stay in a hotel. But anyway, let me continue. <laughs> uh, long, close contact can spread scabies. So it's likely that mites from the wife infected her husband. A weakening immune system in elderly people may increase their susceptibility to a more serious case of scabies and a rash that extends beyond normal rash sites. This might explain the husband's full body rash. Scabbing between the toes is a symptom of scabies and a scraping of the scabbed areas is used for diagnosis. Serious cases of scabies can require large doses of ivermectin given two weeks apart. The link with cellulitis was suggested by a review article in the BMJ's Postgraduate Medical Journal, referenced below, which indicated that untreated scabies may be associated with a secondary bacterial infection of S. pyogenes and present as cellulitis. This article had a lot of other good information as well. Of course, I may have misinterpreted or overstretched parts of this article and other information gleaned online, but crossed fingers, it all makes sense. Whatever the actual parasite was, I wish the couple continued good health. May all of you stay safe and well, masked on the island, Catherine, Vancouver Island. British Columbia. I like that masked on the island. I like that. That's a beautiful place. If you ever get Vancouver Island, hey, yeah, one of been, my favorite spots. It's wonderful. Did you stay at the Wick? I bet you did. <laughs> it was a long time ago. I actually re don't remember where I stayed. Okay. Christina. Jody writes, dear Trip Docs, it's sunny and cold here in Seattle where I just got back from a masked play date that ended with both seven-year-olds discussing the delights of tapeworms and slime molds. In your free time, you guys should definitely write a book for kids. I'd be in for that, actually. 
In the case of the nocturnally itching nonagenarian, I believe he and his wife had ha have had the honor of playing host to the human itch mite, Sarcoptes scabii. These wee arthropods usually set up shop and make themselves known at first in the webbing and size of fingers and toes, later spreading to the rest of the body and often cozying up in other dark warm places like armpits and the nether regions. Scabies is usually transmitted from person to person by direct contact, but can also spread via bedding or clothing. Daniel mentioned a trip in a hotel. Maybe this is where the gentleman's wife picked these little stowaways up, perhaps from unwashed bedding, shudder. According to PD7, infection begins when a gravid female mite is transferred to the new host. She tunnels in through the upper layers of the epidermis and deposits fertilized eggs. The six-legged larvae hatch and begin wandering the body, reinvading and starting new burrows. Then they eat, molt, and move on to their next state as an eight-legged nymph. Young adult female pioneers begin their own new tunnels and the colony grows. The rash that covers the body does not necessarily correspond to where the female mites have set up their homes, but may represent an allergic response. I just looked at an MS, MSN come slideshow of 25 burrowing animals and scabies were somehow not mentioned. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but I do think it would be tough for any mite to compete with a Magellanic penguin, a Colombian ground squirrel or a greater bilby. As I know from personal experience, the itching is the worst at night and the diagnosis can be confirmed through scraping an affected area of skin that contains mites or eggs. As a seven-year-old, I had the pleasure of sitting in a dermatologist's office, having him scrape some skin off my finger, then pointing me toward a microscope. This his isn't this cool message to my young self definitely helped me approach my diagnosis and the vision of the little critters under the lens with more curiosity and wonder than any shame or worry. I spent weeks with my mum covering my whole body with cream and also remember being told that I perhaps caught it from tall grass. Though as an adult, my mum disclosed to me that I had most definitely caught caught it from the kids next door who had memorably questionable personal hygiene habits. Treatment seems to commonly be permethrin cream or benzyl benzoate lotion, but two doses of ivermectin given a week apart are often used with patients who don't respond to creams, are immune suppressed or have crusted scabies. Thanks as always for your commitment to keeping us educated and entertained. Stay safe, Jody. Anders writes, greetings from Ashland, Wisconsin, the sandy south shore of Lake Gishigami. Shortly before our long season of snow, I started, I was suggested by your show by a friend, Vicky from Duluth, episode 186. We just had an email from Vicky. Mm -hmm. I forgot who led our lunchtime chat, me bragging about man I'd met <clears throat> recently who'd eaten several Amanita virosa mushrooms, yet lived, a superman, as the other name for that mushroom is the destroying angel, and it's among the mo world's most deadliest. Or her, my friend and mother-in-law, in her excitement to introduce me to Twip. Well, I'm hooked. Please let me explain. Then I need your advice. On hearing your last qu case quiz, I immediately had a hunch your parasites might be in my blood then was quickly convinced Vicky explained to me her suspicions of scabies, and I had to agree mostly. Details of your case prompted me to think of the old men around here, men like me, good Norwegians. You must be describing <laughs> Norwegian scabies. Anders, son of Frederick Jarl and Andrea Clare, father to the wild women of Wisconsin, Freya, Emily, and Ostra Catherine. <laughs> P.S., Ole and Lena jokes are what I grew up on. Here's one for you. Ole and Lena's neighbor Sven had a boy, Sven Jr., who came home one day and asked, Papa, I have the biggest feet in the third grade. Is that because I'm Norwegian? No, said Sven. It's because you're 19. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, <laughs> boy. PPS, my need for advice, when one is a barefoot runner on the roads and trails of this great North Country and likewise has four-legged best friend whose owner happens to be too foolish to remember anti-helminthic prophylactics, 
What does he do when he finds little albino leech-like organisms on the fur of her cute little caboose and later mixed in with her stool? I observed the little worm stretching itself forward. Then last night gave dewormer medications. No testing was done. Now I'm wondering if I need to treat myself and or my human girls for tapeworms, myself for hookworms, or do anything other than peek at our poop. Take care, Anders. MD is a family physician in emergency medicine, student of life, and in living it. And he says his kids, um, as kids, my family got regular scabies. They brought it home from school. And then he, then he gives a joke. And I'll let everyone go read this because it's a bit long. <laughs> but it's a weather joke. Okay. Dick's... Oh, Wyatt Dick. writes... What? No, and I was going to ask okay. Daniel, we'll come back to this question he has about the worms on his pet. Ah. Yeah, let's, um, yeah, let's come back to that. Right. But yeah, I'm going to... I will remember. Let's get back to that. Right, I think Dick's it's good. We'll get to talk about... Yeah, me too. Two, me too. Two things today. <laughs> okay. Wyatt writes, Hello, Twip Trio. All the best from finally cooler Loma Linda. It has stopped hitting 100 degrees Fahrenheit every day, and I believe everyone is very relieved. My response is a little bit of a buzzer beater because we just had our first large cumulative test on Friday. Our next and second block of medical school is heme and immunology, and hopefully we'll have a few parasitology lectures embedded. I believe that the poor fellow was suffering from Sarcoptes scabii. And given the, the scabbing and the patient's advanced age, it could most likely be classified as Norwegian scabies. The treatment can take some work and involves intensive household cleaning, along with creams for the affected areas of skin. Some of these creams might consist of 5% pimethrum cream, 25% benzyl benzoate lotion, 10% sulfur ointment, or 10% Chromamish. How do you pronounce that, Daniel? <laughs> Giving it to you, Dixon. Just oh, put your way. I'm stumbling over this one. <laughs> Crotamitin. Crotamitin? I'll go with that. Crotamitin cream. Okay. Because I've never heard it pronounced before. Carolo. All the best to. <laughs> okay, fine. All the best to you all. That's a joke, Dixon. Carolo. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a traveling joke from the last episode of Twip. Very good, Daniel. Elise writes, "Dear Twip trifecta, it's a newly chilly for me at least here in Lower Manhattan, fifty-two degrees, eleven degrees C. I hope this finds you all well. I hope very well." very much that my diagnosis attempted this month isn't finding you too late. I got swept up in election activism and I'm just now returning to less high tension diversions. I am not at all sure about my diagnosis attempt, but I wonder if the patient and his wife were both suffering from scabies. This is an uncomfortable rash brought on by their Sarcoptes scabii mite as it burrows under the skin. Scabies can cause awful rashes all over the body, and one of a few favorite spots for the mites to burrow is in the webbing between the fingers and toes. When I heard, first heard about the patient's wife having visited a hotel, I thought that the couple might be dealing with a severe bed bug allergy. The patient brought to mind the story of a friend of mine who had an extended nightmare with her child who was allergic to bed bug bites and do, who did get a full body rash from them. The more I poked around, though, I found that it isn't usually necessary to use oral medications like ivermectin to get rid of the symptoms of bed bug bites, whereas two doses spaced weeks apart is a treatment for scabies infections. While scabies mites are usually shared through direct skin-to-skin -skin contact, a person with a severe case can spread them through towels or upholstery. Perhaps the patient's wife, whose symptoms actually appeared first, brought them home with her. This is not a diagnosis with which I feel particularly confident, but I do hope the couple got relief because from all accounts, this is a really uncomfortable infection and one that tends to be most excruciating at night, making it impossible to sleep. As always, thank you all so very much for all that you do. Many, many best wishes. Elise from Lower Manhattan. Christina. Dave is right. Dear Twip Trio, I watched your podcast as an assignment for a medical microbiology class at Ohio Wesleyan, Wesleyan University, and I really enjoyed it. I wanted to give my input on the most recent case you guys presented. 
I believe scabies is the culprit. Upon a little research, I find that ivermectin is used to treat multiple different kinds of parasitic diseases. One of those such diseases is scabies. Scabies seems to be commonly found around the hands and feet, but can attack the entire body, which is consistent with the information given in the case study. The scabies mites are transmitted by skin contact with an infected person or infected clothing, bedding or towels. It's likely the wife got the initial infection from the hotel she visited and then infected the husband. Ivermectin is also better in repeated doses because it kills the mites but not the eggs. This was also seen in the case study description. I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Davis. Hmm. Kevin writes, toe jamming. <laughs> a grandpa shouldn't be an itchy guy. He ain't no itchy brother. For reference, go back to TWIP 177. <laughs> big fellas need big pills. The dose of ivermectin, not FDA approved for scabies, is 200 micrograms per kilogram. Our patient is 91 kilograms. Total dose, 18,000 micrograms. Standard pharmacy stock ivermectin is three mig tablets. Therefore, the correct dose for him is six tablets, i.e. 18 migs. He was likely underdosed during his first encounter. Scabies was discussed on TWIP 177 and 151. My Google search string Scabies Sanctuary sites fortuitously produced a reference by Scabies enthusiast P.R. Cohen, which contains the phrase might sanctuary sites. It is really very relevant to our case. He's clearly a devotee. Our case summary mentions cream, and I will suppose that this refers to permethrin 5% cream. Scrupulous application of this cream is crucial is to be applied in a thin layer to the entire cutaneous surface. This means every nook and cranny. See endnotes for discussion of the word cranny. <laughs> Nooks and crannies will include underneath fingernails and toenails, between all finger and toe web spaces, all intertriginous regions. And in one of uh, he defines those. Um, this is to give our enemy no quarter, no sanctuary, scorched earth policy, etc. I think that this grandpappy missed his toes when applying the permethrin cream. <laughs> to quote Dr. Cohen, chronic mite infestation can result from inadequate topical application of the scabicide. Many older patients cannot reach their toes or their back. In addition, many individuals do not apply medication to mite sanctuary sites such as beneath all of their fingers and toenails, umbilicus, and perianal area. And then he goes through the uh, the classic scabies can be scabies can be in, divided into several types, which we've talked about. Plausible scenarios of infection, diagnosis, and treatment. Um, and after special treatment, specific treatment has been initiated, topical steroids co-administered. Severe pruritus may require oral steroids. A final scare tactic. Uncommonly, scabies can result in staphylococcal or group A strep infection, so-called bacterial impetignizations. Group A strep infection potentially result in rheumatic fever or post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis concerns more relevant to tropical pediatrics. Looking forward to the Halloween election TWIP podcast. Please don't scare me too much. Thanking <laughs> you three. And then his end notes, of course, full of things. And um, uh, just a terminal curiosity... Our 90-year-old patient, with all due respect, and not to impugn his podo hygiene, put me in the mind of a somewhat neglected term. It has a mad magazine flavor to wit toe jam. <laughs> this man's mites seem to have found a secure fortress down there, and it's possible that an accumulation of said jam could add a piquancy to a mite's evening meal. Much to my surprise, Ooh. the term toe jam is in the Oxford English Dictionary. Toe jam, slang, dirt which accumulates... Between the toes. Dear, dear, dear. And a cranny. What is a cranny? A small, narrow <laughs> opening or hole, a chink, crevice, or fissure. I just don't hear cranny much anymore. If our patient was a woman, I would suggest that it would be the episode would be named Granny's Cranny, but that could be a mite, M-I-T-E, provocative. Great. <laughs> okay. Dixon. <laughs> Yvonne writes, dear Twipsters, case study 188, 
The man with a rash for months and his wife and his also suffering wife could be scabies caused by Cercoptes scabii. This might can be transmitted by close contact or even through clothes and sharing of bedding. So it could be transmitted during the hotel stay of the wife and then from her to her husband. The scraping between his toes probably detected some living mites in the lab. Treatment with ivermectin and maybe some special cream against itching. However, what could one do for prevention? Many thanks to everyone for sharing your passion and knowledge. It's great. With with greetings, Yvonne. Daniel. Alex writes, hello, TWIP. My name is Alex. I am a senior at Ohio Wesleyan University. I am in a medical microbiology class, and our assignment was to listen to episode 188 mm -hmm. and make a diagnosis for the next case. Oh, my gosh. Pressure's on. <laughs> My classmates and I were all put into different discussion groups, and my group discussed scabies and crusted Norwegian scabies, which is common in immunocompromised, elderly, disabled, or debilitated persons. The patient in, is in his 90s, which is why this was discussed. There were a couple of key things that led us down this path, one being the presence and distribution of rash throughout the body, and secondly, when the scab was found on his toe and was sent to the lab, the doctor immediately came back and asked who else he had been in contact with and where he said his wife. Um, scabies is very contagious and is usually spread from human to human contact. And this is most likely how the husband received it from his wife who had the symptoms initially. In terms of medical diagnosis, it could be difficult to determine scabies as the culprit without seeing burrows in the skin. It was imperative, and the primary care doctor noticed that scab on the patient's toe. A skin scraping could be examined under a microscope where mites, eggs, etc., could have been identified. A person can be infected even if there are no signs of mites. Moving on to treatment. The patient found temporary relief with some medications, but the itching always returned and is consistent with the information I found. The CDC says this. Quote unquote, because the symptoms of scabies are due to a hypersensitivity reaction allergy to mites and their feces, Skybala, itching still may continue for several weeks after treatment, even if all the mites and eggs are killed. If itching still is present more than two to four weeks after treatment, or if new burrows or pimple like rash lesions continue to appear, retreatment may be necessary. The use of ivermectin in treatment of crusted scabies and classic scabies is not FDA approved, but there is evidence that shows it is a safe and effective treatment, specifically with crusted scabies. Ivermectin should be taken in three. This was the final dosage that the patient received, five or even seven doses. I could be totally off, but it was worth a shot. I look forward to possibly hearing my response on the next episode. Thank you for the fun and engaging case study. All the best, Alex. Christina. Julie writes, dear Twippers, a friend in NYC sent me a link to Twiff in March and I have been listening to all the Microbe TV podcasts since then. Mm -hmm. they, have been they have accompanied me and my dogs on many long pandemic walks. I am not a scientist. I train horses for a living. However, I really have enjoyed listening and I have used the information on Microbe TV as the basis of a science class for my now homeschooled daughter. My 11-year-old can discuss whether or not a virus is alive. Thanks, Vincent. <laughs> <laughs> My dogs are the reason I am sending in a guest for case study 188. It is a bit intimidating hearing all the responses in other episodes from people who are clearly far more educated and erudite about medical issues. But I have many years of experience with animals and served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Mali and believe I have a good guess. Several years ago, one of my dogs had an encounter with a coyote. A few weeks after that encounter, she started itching intensely, particularly around her ears and paws. A couple of different vets believed she had allergies and prescribed various allergy medications, anti-itch creams and a short course of prednisone. The treatments helped a little bit, but it always came back. After a few months, the poor dog looked like a cooked lobster, red and hairless. Month later, and after a visit to yet another vet, she was finally diagnosed with sarcoptic mange. Two treatments with ivermectin, and it was gone. 
My guess is that this gentleman's wife picked up scabies during her hotel stay. Scabies in humans is often transferred by close contact, such as sleeping in the same bed with someone who is infected. Scabies mites often infect areas between the toes and fingers and can cause intense itching that gets worse at night. I am very happy to hear the gentleman in this case mm. find relief. Julie. Nice story about the, the dog. Mm. I like that. All right, Josie writes, dear TWIP masters, thank you for filling my ears with science every morning as I've been working my way through the entire back catalog of the show. I've been saving up questions and comments for months. Try to keep it to one per email. Okay, guess for 188, 90-year-old man, I can think of two possibilities. He and his wife have either been bitten by sand fleas and have cases of tungariasis, or we have another case of scabies. Without a book, I'm going to have to limit my guesses and research, but perhaps Santa Claus will have set ones aside for me. While it's true, I could easily download the PDF to my Kindle. I'm currently not getting along with it very, very well, not to mention that as a lifelong reader, I really am happier with a book. It feels right, smells right. There's nothing like a book in your hand. And a screen, while useful here where I live in library hell, just isn't the same. Anyway, since I am part of the armchair scientist branch of the family and not a real doctor, MD or PhD, we've got one of each. Do you really want me attempting to treat your patients, even hypothetically? <laughs> Anyhow, I do sympathize with the itchy plight of two poor souls. <clears throat> An unlucky allergic run-in with itraconazole left me sleepless for several nights due to full body hives. They even brought in the students to view my textbook example. Fortunately, prednisone and some very powerful antihistamines provided first some sleep and relief. I hope this man and his wife were at least able to get some sleep. This brings me to a question. As soon after Dr. Griffin joined the group, I started noticing a pattern. Some of the names of the drugs being discussed sounded like antifungals. Then one morning he said the dread word itraconazole. I no longer recall which parasitic infection this was meant to treat. But the question remains, for those who are allergic to sporinox itraconazole and therefore likely to react similarly to other drugs in that family, what alternative options are there, if any? Would I be stuck? I hope to someday travel as extensively as any of the three of you have. So I would like to know what if there is something I should be more than extra cautious about. Thank you greatly from library hell, where the weather <laughs> is unsatisfyingly pleasant in the low 70s. This New Englander missed real fall. Um <laughs> This next one was, we already did. Yes, we and did. we that's did true. the next one after that. We did Julie. Yes, that's it. Yes. We're done. Mm -hmm. we did. Okey doke. My apologies for the duplications. No worries. Um, no worries. Okay, Daniel. All right. So um, these were some great emails. This is really good. Um, should we have a little discussion? Do we want um, everyone here to weigh in? Let's start with you, Dixon. Dixon, why don't you weigh? What are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm thinking probably what 99.9% .9 of everybody else was thinking uh, in that, that this is a classic case of scabies. I think to call it Norwegian scabies is a little stretch. Uh, especially if you're a Norwegian, I think that's a pejorative term. Uh, then we might want to consider uh, dropping it from our textbook. It's a, it's just because someone's immunosuppressed that they, they accumulate all these uh, mites. Um, but it's like I think it's pretty straightforward to be very honest. Okay. I, there was one guest though that said strongyloides, and I I understand why they said it. But um, it really doesn't present like this at all. And uh, in fact, there are more serious consequences because of the uh, hyperinfection cycle of strangeloides under immunosuppressive conditions. So uh, I would have eliminated that just for that reason. And the, as far as the dog is concerned, is this the time to bring that up or should we wait? Um, no, let's let's do the round first and then, yeah, let's make sure we discuss the dog issue as well. Um, sure. Vincent, should we let you go next? So I also thought of scabies because we've had it, I think, twice on TWIP. So it rang a bell. Right. The interdigit by now, right? <laughs> the inter between the toes was something yeah. itching. But also I asked Daniel, you know, did any of them go somewhere? And he said, yes, his wife stayed at a hotel and that kind of clinched it for me. Yeah, I think so. Christina, did you want to weigh in? Yes, um, I, I'm fairly confident um, that this is a, an infection, a scabies infection. Um, so the main reasons also being um, 
the toe scrapings and what, what the, the primary care doctor found in that. I presume you didn't describe it, but I presume it presume it would have been mites or maybe mm. eggs um, that you can quite often see actually in the skin scrapings. And I also thought it was really a classical presentation in that. Um, you know, with his itchy rash, and um, which is actually an immune reaction, if I if I remember correctly, and it's not that this man is infested with scabies all over his body. Um, it's it's just a reaction really to it, and um, I wasn't sure about his treatment, his initial treatment. It didn't really say what dose it was. It just said three pills, um, but I, I assume he was essentially reinfected by his wife because it only later turned out that actually, well, his wife had also suffered from the same issues and I did wonder why um she had not sought help actually for that um <laughs> but I guess we'll never find out um <laughs> I'm glad he's doing well and his wife is doing well too yeah so that um is a fantastic um sort of everybody um you know it's nice the person mentioned stronger ladies but that's wrong um, <laughs> but, uh, um and, and some of the emails really hit um some of the what i thought were important or classic or interesting features um so the scraping did confirm it when it was scraped there were the eggs there were actually the mites seen um, and I think I've talked about when I travel, sometimes I'll even bring a dermoscope where you can actually look and see um, mm -hmm. with magnification um, mm -hmm. these um, sort of chevrons, which are the, the female mites. Um, there were a couple of things that I thought were interesting. One, right, was that there wasn't this thorough exam. There was sort of the uh, throw creams, throw pills. And so I, I applaud the primary care doc who actually, um, you know, remembers that the physical exam can play a role. And uh, this is a bit neglected in current times with video chats. Mm. Um, I guess you could have said, all right, we're going to do a full body. Uh, let's have you strip down. Let me see between the toes. Let's get those toes up to the camera. And um, it is entertaining. You know, sometimes I'm looking at cellulitis in a telehealth visit and uh, they're moving the, you know, you don't have to move the legs. You could actually move the laptop and show me um, the rash <laughs> on the legs. Um, but the interesting issue, and I think that these are the patterns, this is one of the things I know. Um, I've seen several times where someone has a localized area of, um, of scabies, whether it's between the fingers, whether it's between the toes, but they have a full body allergic reaction. And that's not the distribution of scabies. That's a full body allergic reaction, um, which then you say, okay, you're having, you're allergic to something. What are you reacting to? And it's the scabies, right? You're scratching, you're getting this um, material all over yourself. Um, the other is the issue um, about um, is it Norwegian or just regular scabies? And I think it's just regular scabies, I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The crusted scabies, which I've seen, is really people don't have a good immune system and they have so much in the way of scabies and they usually have not much in the way of a response. They're often not even particularly itchy. Um, they seem not to really be bothered by the fact that they have uh, such a disseminated, disseminated form. Um, we've also talked a little, I think, in the past about the distributions. We see different distributions of scabies when we see it in the tropics versus when we see it in temperate climes. Um, so I think that's an interesting thing to note as well. The distribution could be different. Um, the other, I, I tried to make a big point of this was a, a big man. And he was given only three pills of the, in the U.S., it's a three milligram. So he was given about half the dose, only dosed once, not given a dose the second time. Um, the other, which is a huge issue we see in the tropics, is, you know, Occam's razor, right? You can only have one thing to explain everything. Um, but often you have two things. You have your scabies, but then you end up super infected, um, you know, with a strep or staph super infection. Um, and that can actually lead to a lot of complications. Um, so I think a lot of things were kind of hit hit well here. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we had a lot of guesses. We had 20 some odd, 28. That's great. Wow. Wow. Is that a new record? I don't know. I have to check. All right. And should we now, now let's hit on the dog, Dixon. Let's talk about the dog. Let's do that just briefly. But <laughs> so this dog obviously has some form of a tapeworm infection and the proglottids have 
independent motility, that is the segments of the tapeworm can actually separate from the rest of the tapeworm and look like little worms, but actually they're part of a large colony. Uh, there are several species. Uh, Tania pisiformis is one and um, a di um, philo no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank on the dog tapeworm of all things, but it's a dog tapeworm that you, we can catch by eating a flea that is fed on dog feces containing the eggs of that parasite. But you can't catch the parasite by coming in contact with the proglottids or the entire worm or even the eggs. You've got to get the, uh, this, the stage that um, develops inside of the flea that's acquired as they eat the egg of the uh, tapeworm. So um, no, no real danger, except that uh, you have to give a good uh, uh, anti sesto drug, and there are lots of them available out there, so uh, but the, no the, problem. The, the people don't have to be treated, right? No. No, no, you know. No, but this is a common infection in little kids whose families routinely have dogs. Okay. And the dogs will bite off a flea and, and then they'll lick the kid in the face and then the kid will swallow the flea and that's Got the it. way they catch the infection. Okay. Was oh. it Dipilidium caninum, Dixon? It's Dipilidium caninum. Of course it is, Christine. Thank you so much. You're looking at an aging You're very welcome. process. <laughs> <laughs> I could not come up with that name. I'm very sorry. No, that that would be on the I cheated oh, while you were talking. You know what? Leave it, leave it in, Vincent. Don't edit that out. That's, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we all I'm forget not even things. embarrassed by that. All right. Uh, let's give away a book. Yeah. And um, so 28 guesses. We do a random number generator. For you want a drum roll? 28. Boom. We got 19. Which? Number 19. Who is number, number 19? Jody. Jody. That's Jody. 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 All right, Jody, Jody. from Did you uh, want a book? Seattle. There you go. You're the winner. Send me your address to twip at microbe.tv. And uh, we will, you know, these are... We have to wait for us to get together to autograph this. So maybe soon, yeah. maybe Daniel will come here and then Dixon and uh, we'll get him out. But uh, be patient. Yeah, we, we, we can blame it on COVID-19 if we really want to, but it's not true. Dixon, <laughs> do you have a hero, Dixon? I have a hero. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an unknown hero. It's, it's a person that I have deeply admired all my adult life since I've known about him and then met him. But I've, I've also picked him on an, an earlier twiv. In fact, twice I picked him. Uh, but we didn't have heroes on that show, so I picked him for other reasons. Uh, his name is Tony Fauci. Tony Fauci has survived through thick and thin of this current administration. He has remained a professional person throughout the entire public appearance that he has been part of. He has never complained once on on um, on the air he has uh, when he came on our show i remember one of the remarks he made which was quite funny which i won't say right now because i think he didn't want it to be broadcast on the air but he's he's a wonderful even-tempered scientist who doesn't lose his cool and continues to um, I think academically pull out his hair every time he thinks about what's going on now with people not distancing, not wearing masks and not listening to common sense. And uh, he, he's just, for me, he's the, he is the quintessential hero, a living hero. So I've picked him for that reason. Yeah, he's great, great hero, great, perfect person. And uh, yeah, he's uh, been terrific. And I hope that he stays on because, you know, the president's been threatening to fire him, which I think is the worst thing that you the can do. The president can't fire him, though, because he has a, he's a government position that's not elected. Yeah, well, that's he's good. A tenured, he's a tenured person at NIH. Good. Anyway, uh, he's been on TWIV twice, 219 and 641. That's right. That's right. Okay, Christina, it's your turn to give us a oh. case. <laughs> okay, so this is very exciting. <laughs> so as you know, I'm an educator and I don't see patients myself. But what I did, what I thought would be really interesting and fun, I, I reached out to um, our previous students and current students. Uh, some of them have gone, you know, have traveled far and wide and have done some volunteering in, in all parts of the world. So this case was sent to me um, by our previous student, Helen. She had seen this patient while she was on a medical team 
um, and she was supporting the work of a charity, Hernia International Carpenter in Ghana. Um, I think, I believe Carpenter is a Canadian city, but I'm not sure. But anyway, that's the name of the, the um, charity she was working for. So this medical team provides hernia operations for a duration of two weeks every year in this particular um, place in Ghana. Patients attend the clinic to be assessed and if necessary, they are listen, listed for surgery. So Helen's patient, a woman, she attended the clinic thinking she had a hernia. She was seen first by the surgical team. So she presented with a large swelling in the right upper abdomen, um, which had grown steadily over the previous year. She said it wasn't particularly painful, but that she was increasingly aware of it. On, ex ex on examination, she was found to have a mass, but it was too high for an inguinal hernia and the examining surgeon could feel the lower edge of this mass. It was thought to be a mass in her liver. So then she was referred to see the medical team where Helen, our previous student, examined her. The woman is described as a mother and subsistence farmer, probably in her 50s. She didn't report feeling particularly unwell. She had no jaundice. She didn't look pale. She was fully mobile, overweight to obese, but looking really quite strong. The lump was firm and it wasn't fluctuant. And in other words, it did not appear to flee, be fluid filmed. And also, um, it didn't reduce when pressure was put on it. It appeared relatively smooth and was over 20 centimeters in diameter. The concern was liver cancer. It, due to the remoteness of the clinic and the limited resources that they had, it was not possible to order any tests that might be possible in better resourced health centers. But there was one further examination and test that was done, which was able to deliver a conclusive diagnosis. And my question now to you and our audience is, what would be your diagnosis and what test examination do you think was used to reach this diagnosis? And that's my case. All right. I don't think it's a diagnosis we have seen very often on TWIP, but that might just be my failing memory. <laughs> <laughs> they mentioned well, it that is, join the group. <laughs> you, you mentioned that this is this lady is a farmer, so she spends the day uh, outdoors. She does spend the day outdoors, looking. Um, yeah, okay. so she she was kind of working near the dwellings um, where she lived. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, so is she is she worked barefoot. Um, I don't have that information. I'm afraid. Okay. Does um, she have animals? As, uh... So yes, um, she 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 said that there were many sheep and goats that live in and around the compounds um, in the village, mm -hmm. alongside the families, and there were also dogs. Mm -hmm. Roger, Roger that. <laughs> and um, but you said it. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm just going to ask for how how um, definitive is the statement? It did not appear to be fluid filled. Well, I can only take Helen's word for it because I haven't examined the patient myself. Right. Um, so I'm afraid that's what we have to go okay. with. Okay. 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 I'm sorry. Say no more. <laughs> say no more. <laughs> and um, one last question from me. Mm -hmm. So uh, she lives by herself so she's described as a mother so i presume she lives with her children okay. i don't know if her husband was mentioned or any extended other family members and you don't know um, about the not mentioned. you don't know about the health status of uh, other family members no i don't have any of that okay. information and and uh, for when these individuals what's the um the toilet situation here what what do they do for that do you know? I I don't know either. Okay. I wouldn't know. Uh, but but I, I presume it would be fairly um, minimal. So it may, maybe pit latrines. Okay. Um, from the des description of the vil the village where she lived, I, I would assume it may be shared pit latrines. But that that's my guess. That's not actually okay. information that I have. 
Do you know if so she's... It could, uh, it, it could be a Japanese three-button flush toilet for all that. <laughs> we, we suspect not. I don't think so, <laughs> but right? But we suspect not. Yes. <laughs> all right. And do you know if she's uh, HIV negative or positive? I don't know. Okay. Sorry, these are all the questions I asked Daniel, you know. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so this was actually a very remote clinic uh, and they were very, you know, it was essentially just a team that yeah. went out to, to, to look for hernias and treat those. So I, I would imagine it wasn't very well equipped. Um, but uh, yeah. Got it. All right. Anything else from okay. Dixon or Daniel? Oh, I don't. I don't think we want to ask too many questions. I think not at this, this time. Enough. Not at this time. Yeah, this is enough for. Uh, That's right. That's I think right. We don't want to give the diagnosis away. <laughs> All right. Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, Christina, you're going to come back when we when we read the the uh, submissions. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I would love to do that. Yes, I really enjoyed this evening. Yeah, oh, we, we, will have, we will schedule it with you. Sure. Okay. All right. I'm flexible because it's nighttime for me anyway. True. And there is no social life. <laughs> <laughs> but if we do it on a Friday night, you'll be out and about at the bars in uh, Glasgow. Yeah. No, actually, all the bars are closed here. So bars have been closed since, How about I that? think, mid-September, oh beginning of gosh. October. Oh so gosh. we've had quite strict restrictions here in Glasgow. So huh? um, is, no is, indoor uh, visits, no nothing. Are so. schools all closed as well? Schools are open, so I think the main aim of the Scottish government is to keep schools open for as long as possible and shut down everything else. Mm -hmm. So hospitality is closed um, and there's no indoor meetings mm -hmm. at all, um, not even with family. So I haven't actually had my son over for Sunday lunch for weeks hmm. and um, dear, outdoors dear. we're also only allowed to meet in groups of maximum maximum six people from two households wow. so we've been really good and mask there's a mask mandate in shops and schools and just mm -hmm. all indoor places essentially wow and, Christine and, and, I wanted to ask you a question a political mm -hmm. question what what happens if Scotland secedes from <laughs> the UK and your course is given who will certify your students well, I, I presume we can still work together. Um, okay. I, I don't really see there being an issue, but I hadn't actually thought about it. So now I'm, I'm probably going to start worrying. But there is, <laughs> <laughs> there I is also. <laughs> I mean, we, we could we could potentially offer our own Glasgow University um, certification, but there's also the Royal College of um, Physicians in Edinburgh. Yeah. But. Um, I, I, I don't imagine that would be an issue, really. But a good, okay. good a good thought, really. Yeah. How do you stand yeah. on that, by the way? <laughs> well, I mean, two minds. Um, yeah, I, I think, I don't know. It sounds like a really nice and quaint idea, but I'm not sure how economically viable an independent Scotland would be. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Okay. I don't Thank know. You. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm going to anticipate that, uh, you know, that the training there in Glasgow is going to become more popular, um, right? People will be able to access it remotely. And if anything, the yep. need for people in global health is just a uh, balloon. So we really mm. need a lot of people. Um, yeah. Up in. And we've actually just created an online only course now for students only in low and middle income countries at the, with a much lower fee structure so that, um, you know, we can reach students who may not normally be able to mm -hmm. afford the course. Right. And I think the examination is potentially also going to move online, which again will then, you know, open up really um the market where we can educate students much further because traveling is expensive and visa restrictions make it really difficult from sure. for people from low and middle income countries to travel to the UK. So yeah, it's a lot of exciting things on no, their that's, way. That's tremendous. I mean, cause yeah. you really, you know, you don't want this sort of the model that we've had where you educate people in these high resource and then send them out. Ideally yeah. you want to create yeah. that human capital in these countries. You want to have the yeah. education Right. You know, to to yeah. quote our to quote our mission, right? Getting knowledge yeah. to the people in places that need it the most. Yeah. So yeah. That's yeah. it. That's it. Yeah. And we now actually have scholarship 
for students in African countries and also some Southeast Asian countries. And that's been really fantastic. And we then, you know, we then invite the students to contribute to the course in future years because they have all really good, um, amazing stories and amazing clinical experiences that then, you know, again, add to our own course. So really, really, it's been really, really exciting in the past two, three years. Hmm. So. All right, that'll that'll do it for TWIP 189. You can find all the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIP. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. Of course, for the month of November, if you go over to parasiteswithoutborders.com and make a contribution there, they will match it and provide it to uh, microbe, all the podcasts of microbe.tv. And your questions and comments, Guesses for the case, TWIP, T-W-I-P at microbe.tv. Our guest today from the University of Glasgow, Christina Naula. Thank you, Christina, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. I love to being here. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University, Irving Medical Centers and ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thanks, Daniel. Oh, a pleasure as always. Dixon de Pommiers at trichinella.org and the livingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Dipolidium caninum. Dipolidium caninum. Dipolidium caninum. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't believe I didn't remember that, but I didn't. <laughs> and I cheated. No, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. I, <laughs> you're invited back anytime. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. Music on TWIP is by Ronald Jenkins, and we thank the ASM for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is, is parasitic. parasitic. parasitic.